we start? I think we should. All right. All right. Let's go. So, hi everybody. I am Janelle Holstead, and I am the chair of the Human Development Program. And this is. Do you want to? Yeah, something? I'm Ryan Martin. I'm the chair of the Psychology Program, and we're going to talk about grad school. Yeah. So, if you're viewing this, you are likely interested in applying for graduate school, which is very cool. A lot of students think about it at some point or another and wonder if it's for them. A lot of students plan to go to graduate school or think about it to really further their career options. If you think about your psychology undergrad degree, it's very broad and really general, right? You're taking classes in cognitive psych, in social psych, in developmental psych perhaps, and you're kind of studying all of psychology. In graduate school, it's a lot more specialized than that. You could go to get a, you know, a master's degree or a PhD in school psych or in cognitive psych or um, in you know, marriage and family counseling or something like that that's a lot more honed in and specific. To give you just kind of a broad overview of what grad school is like, if you go to a master's program, they tend to be about two years. A doctorate program uh, tends to be between four and six, kind of depending. There are doctoral programs that are combined, masters and doctoral, so you could go from undergrad into doctoral uh, degree. That's what I did, I don't know what you did. I did a combined. A combined as well. Um, or you could just go for your masters, or you could go for your masters and then later decide to go to a, a doctorate program, and depending on what courses you've taken and what institutions you're going to, it, it might slim down the amount of time that the doctoral degree would require, but it might not, it would depend on those organizations. Um, it tends to be a lot more hands-on, I would say, graduate school. You know, in undergrad, it's all you really need to do, <laughs> you know, to graduate is to take classes. We say you need to do more. We want you to do more independent learning experiences, but those aren't really required, whereas they would be required in graduate school where you would be doing more hands-on kinds of things for the most part. Mm -hmm. Oh, this isn't going to work then. Oh, no. Is it not on? Oh. It's... Not liking. There. Right. All right. All right. So one of the things you decide is uh, when you when you start this process. One of the first things you decide is, you know, where you want to go, what kind of program you want to go to, and things like that. And there are a couple things. Yeah. Let me just put everything up. So there's a, a couple things to be thinking about as you make that decision. Um, and the first is, does this program match your goals? And so at that point, you know. I think typically when people come into college, a lot of times they don't necessarily know what they want to do career-wise, and that makes sense. By the time you go to graduate school, that those decisions are going to be much more honed, right? And so, uh, that said, I changed when I was in graduate school from being a clinician to being a professor. But, um, but I think that by and large, you want to think about the, the goals you have career-wise and see if does this program do what I want to do. Um, and, and, you know, will, will graduates essentially um, be uh, our, our graduate. One of the questions I always ask is, are graduates out doing the kinds of things that I want to be doing uh, down the road? So, um, one of the questions you're going to have to ask yourself is, how competitive is the program to get into? Um, graduate schools oftentimes are very, very, very competitive, um, and so it's something to be aware of because they get a lot more applications than they have spots, um, and that's just a reality of the process. So you have to think about whether or not you have a, a realistic chance of getting into to the school. One of the things you have to say, and I'm going to uh, kind of mention these two in tandem a little bit, but where are you willing to live uh, is another piece. And one thing I would say is I, my experience, and we're going to talk later about some success rates for our students. My experience with many students is that the more you limit yourself geographically, the harder time people seem to have getting into graduate schools. Part of that is just that a lot of the graduate schools in Wisconsin are really competitive. Part of it is just that the more you sort of broaden your what you're, where you're willing to live, um, just you're gonna open up some, sometimes programs are competitive, not because they're great programs, but because they're in desirable locations. And so you see some programs that are really good programs, maybe aren't as competitive because people aren't as interested in living there. So if you broaden that out, you're probably gonna be more successful. Um, finally, do the faculty research interests match yours, right? Are faculty doing the kinds of work that you want to do uh, at this program? And part of that's going to be linked to success that you're not just trying to get in a graduate program, they're trying to find great students that they want to work with, and so they want to find students who are interested in doing what they do. Um, and so you need to make sure that you're going to be happy doing that work. One other thing that I would just mention about, you know, um, the point two up there about the competition 
know, aspect of that is really to think about psychology tends to be like the number one or number two most popular major at the undergrad level. We have about, you know, 600 majors or so on campus. And when you're looking at graduate programs, those tend to be very small. So it goes from a very large program that everyone can get into to very, very small specific programs. And so in school psych, for example, most of the programs only accept 15 students. Mm -hmm. They have 100 applicants and they accept 15. And so it is yep. it is very competitive. Yep. Is the thing that I would just put out there too. Yes. Okay, it's not gonna like us again. Oh, there was one more. There's one more about funding. Oh, yeah. Do you want so to funding opportunities. So a, a lot of times, um, the master's programs tend to not be funded as a general rule, I would say. Um, okay, the software needs to be updated. Um, but the funding opportunities for the master's program tend to be more limited than the doctoral programs. So if you are a student that is thinking about doing a doctoral program, having a combined program right away might be a good op option for you. Um, and when I say funding opportunities, I mean like, like uh, a program that might, pr may, might um, cover your tuition and may give, might give you like a living stipend. Like that stipend tends to be very small and just above the poverty level, not very good at all, but it's definitely better than going in, more in debt and those right. sorts of things. And typically those, those funding opportunities are for things like research assistantships or teaching assistantships. So you're right. working for someone there who is then- Right, know, it's essentially like if having a job. Yeah. Um, it's just through your program. We have a question. Um, how many graduate schools should you apply to to help increase your chances of getting in? We got data on that later on. Yes, we'll, we'll for sure it. cover that in a minute. Yep. Or maybe question. like 10 minutes, but yeah. Okay, so one of the questions that we tend to get a lot of is should I go to an online program or a for profit school? And our general, you know, kind of advice on that is, is to really think about these kinds of things. Online and for profit schools tend to have very high acceptance rates meaning that 100 students apply and they accept all of them. Or, I, you know, I, I don't have the data on that specifically, but they accept a lot of the people that end up applying. And so you're not really standing out. You're, you know, you're, um, you're just one of the, the crowd and you're probably paying a little bit more money than you would for a traditional in-person or, um, or one of the more accredited um, kinds of programs. So you wanna be very careful about, you know, going that route. Um, because of those kinds of reasons. The other thing to really think about is, is that program going to get you the kind of job that you're interested in getting? So for example, in school psych, which is my area of expertise, right now there are no online only school psych programs. If a program were to um, advertise themselves as such, you could get your school psych masters, but you wouldn't be able to be accredited through the, de through the Department of Public Instruction to be able to become a school psychologist. So it's kind of this catch-22 where you pay all this money, get a master's degree, that essentially doesn't give you the option to do the job that you want. So you have to be very, very careful about those kinds of things. We, we, there was a similar, and this is probably less true now than it used to be, but there was a similar issue in for-profit schools and counseling and clinical psych that they had much, much, when you talk about licensure, they had much uh, higher failure rates on licensure exams. Um, and the, that meant, you know, of course, that students were getting this degree and then they weren't necessarily able to practice because they had, or, or it took them many, many, many more tries to practice. Yeah. So, so there are some things to watch out for there. Right. And that's not me, in my case, I'm not saying you shouldn't consider those options. I'm saying you just have to be aware of what, what the, those outcomes are. Right, I would say if you're interested in those talk to your faculty advisor mm -hmm. about those types of things and see what their advice would be. Yeah. Okay. Oh, this is me. Okay, yeah. I think so. Yeah, so um, the application form, we're gonna run through this pretty pretty quickly, but the application process uh, in general, and what we'll see is that a lot of different programs are gonna have different requirements, but really when you think about what you have to submit as part of this, it's uh, an application form, so similar to what you would have done for uh, for college, uh, your transcripts, you're gonna need a resume or a, a curriculum vita. Um, you're gonna need oftentimes a writing sample. So they might wanna see like a paper you wrote in a class or something like that that you can submit. Um, almost all programs, probably all programs, are gonna have some sort of personal statement. So this is either gonna be an answer to a, a, a particular essay question 
or it's going to be a bunch of essay questions that you answer each of those. Um, there's going to be probably a, the GRE, the Graduate Record Examination, um, which is probably most similar to like the ACT or the SAT, but at the graduate level. Some programs are going to include a different type of test. Uh, and so it's not the GRE, but it's another test, maybe the MAT or, or something like that. Uh, letters of recommendation. Um, typically, I think the mode is three as far as how many letters of recommendation people have to submit, but it can be, um, uh, it can be more than that, it can be less than that. And then a lot of programs are going to require or want some sort of interview, sometimes in person, sometimes over the phone, sometimes over Skype, things like that. The, the most important, important piece of information I have regarding this is to start early looking at what programs require. Because you might find, for example, that, this, that the program that you really want to go to doesn't require the GRE, but requires a different test. And you need to take that test, right, as part of it. Or you need to decide, I'm not applying to that program. Um, and so those are things that you got to start early, figure out what that is. I think the, the most critical part of this process is really being organized, starting early, and recognizing it's a lot of work. A lot of students tell me that they consider it about the equivalent of a class that way. And I don't think we've covered this yet, but we, you tend to apply in the fall for admission in the following fall. So most of the, you know, every school is going to have a different deadline. Some schools might be December 1st, others might be March 1st, and anything in between or even before or after that. So really looking at their website saying like, okay, here are the things that they need, even creating some kind of grid or checklist for all the schools that you're thinking of applying to, and then checking off the boxes on what has been submitted to where, because it's a lot of pieces of information going to potentially a number of different areas. So you wanna make sure that you're included. And a lot of times the schools will say, oh, we didn't get your one letter of recommendation or we didn't get your personal statement. Sorry, we know you applied, but you're not in our batch that we're actually looking at. So you want to make sure that you're really checking off all of those boxes and making sure that you get that information. All right, so the personal statement, as Ryan said, the personal statement tends to be a staple in um, the graduate application process. Um, each school is a little bit different in terms of what they want. They might, there might be some schools that, are, that just say, write a personal narrative or write a personal statement and give you no direction at all. And there might be other schools that give you very specific questions um, or a specific question that you need to answer. The biggest advice I have regarding the personal statement and the narratives is that you wanna make sure that each one is really tailored to each school that you're going to. You don't want to write a generic one that you send to five different places. That wouldn't be very good. And you have, you have to think about the reader that's reading this. They don't want to feel like they've gotten something that's going to every other school. So a trick that I always tell people is like, look at the faculty that are at that specific school and call them out. If we had a graduate program here today and you were applying to UWGB, you could say, hey, I want to work with Dr. Martin because of his research in anger. And I want to work with Dr. Polstead because of her research in after school. And then when we, as the you know admitters of that program, see that, it would be really cool for us to say, wow, this student is excited to come here um, to this campus, not just any campus that's out there. Well, that speaks to a bigger uh, thing too, is that, that unlike when you apply to college, when you apply to graduate school, a lot of times the people who are making the decisions, it's not, the, it's not like this abstract, abstract group of admissions people, it's the faculty in that program who make the decision. So if they ask specific questions, they're asking those questions because they care about them. They, they care deeply about the answers to those questions, and so they're going to want to see that you put time into it and thought into it. And it really, I think, Janelle's absolutely right that personalizing or, or making it or tailoring is better yeah. to that program is really important. Absolutely. The GRE. So the GRE is a test. I already mentioned a lot of this. It's a, a test similar to the ACT, uh, but for graduate school admissions. There's actually two forms of the GRE. There's the general test and there's a subject test. And the subject test is specific to psychology. Uh, well, I mean, there's lots of subject tests, but there's one for psychology that people sometimes have to take. So this is data from last year, I think, mm -hmm. right? That, yes. that we found that 73% um, of our students who applied to graduate school had to take the general test. 12% um, had to take the specific, the psych-specific test. So that gives you a sense of, of whether or not you're gonna need to do this. That said, the best thing to do is to go, like I said, be early, check out what needs to be done. 
Um, the one, the, another piece we haven't talked about here is that this process can be expensive. So there is oftentimes a fee, uh, not oftentimes, there is a fee to take the GRE. There are also fees to send scores to particular schools. Um, and so I think when you pay, you get a couple that you get to send it to automatically, but then anytime you want to send it to additional schools, you have to pay for that. Um, the other thing to say is uh, that there are, as I mentioned, there are some other tests that you may have to consider. About 18% of our students had to take the MAT uh, last year. So that, um, you know, that's based on what school they, schools they decided to apply to. Um, there are, we, we don't recommend you go into the test cold by any means. You want to, um, if you're wondering about the GRE, if you think you might need to take it, go to their website. Um, find out, you schedule it online, uh, at least for the general test, um, and you have to go and go to a place and take it at an individual time. They book up relatively quickly, so you might, you have to plan ahead on that. Um, there's all sorts of opportunities to um, take like practice courses, there's practice books you can buy at the bookstore um, or online. Uh, one of them is Are there some in the seat wing? There are, yeah, there are some of the C wing in the in the library uh, outside the Student Success Center that you can get, uh, or that you can check out or take a look at. But ultimately, we recommend you you eventually get your own once you decide which one you want because they have a lot of practice tests as part of it, and that's probably the best thing you can do is take those practice tests uh, a couple times. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that any time that you like, if you take it once and you don't like your score and you take it again. The schools still get all of your scores. They do. So if you take that exam cold, bomb it, that's not a good thing. No. And you've wasted the yeah. money that you've spent on the on the test. So you want to make sure that you really plan ahead, that you study to do well the first time, and then you can always take it a second time to increase your scores, but just know that the schools will see your whole record that's of that exam. That's it. I say this as someone who took the GRE twice. Whether or not you should take it twice is a very, very sort of nuanced, contextual question that you should sit down and talk to your advisor about before you do it. Um, because there are times where it's, I wouldn't recommend it, and there are times when I would, and it really is, depends on the person and, and the situation. So, um, but Janelle's absolutely right. You, you don't want to have to take it a second time if you don't, uh, if, if, if you don't need to, if it's not the best move. So prep for it that first time, try and make that your best. Yeah. Alright, so letters of recommendation. As Ryan already said, lots of schools require letters of recommendation. Three tends to be the norm that a school recommends or, or requires a, a student to have. Um, most schools, correct me if I'm wrong, don't specifically say that they should come from faculty, but my general recommendation is that you would get people that have the same degree that you're hoping to get. So in other words, if you're wanting to go into a master's in counseling or if you want to get a doctoral degree, then it would make sense to have people that have been in master's programs or in doctoral programs write those letters of recommendation. Basically, the schools that you're applying to want letters of recommendation from people who have been through graduate school and through doctoral programs or through advanced degrees to be able to say that this particular student can handle the level of work and the rigor that's required in that particular program. So in general, faculty letters would be, I would say, the, the best possible letter, and then job employers or other people. Um, letters of recommendation should never come from friends, families, personal connections. It should come from the faculty, um, or as, as a tier two, I would say, the employer um, that you've been with for a very long time in a relevant field yep. that, to what you're, you're going for. Yep, and I would completely agree. I think the one caveat you, that you mentioned that I uh, want to expand on is the uh, like the internship supervisor, something like that, if it's a very relevant is the position. I still think that the faculty is the best option, but there are times where an internship supervisor who is in a very similar area might be a good option. That's a good question for an advisor uh, yeah. as you kind of walk through that. Yeah. So. And as you're thinking about, you know, getting letters of recommendation or as you're preparing, you know, to apply for graduate school in the future, it's really beneficial to do independent learning experiences with the faculty so that they get to know you more in a one-on-one -on -one setting than in the, the than in the classes that we have, right? So, uh, you know, it's it's possible that a, that a, a faculty member that had you in a first year seminar and in the capstone experience could totally write you a great letter, but there's still 25 other students in that classroom. If you, you know, are asking a faculty member that's had you in middle childhood and adolescence or abnormal psychology, 
that's 45 students in that classroom, and so that's also going to be kind of difficult um, to be able to really speak to your academic potential. So internships, um, research assistantships, uh, teaching assistantships, um, honors projects, all really good experiences so that you can help you know, ensure that that letter of recommendation is as strong as it's possibly going to be. Um, and if you're an online only student, it's also super important to try to seek out those research assistantships and internship opportunities um, as well. Any of those opportunities to get to know your faculty one-on-one -on -one is beneficial. And I would say even more so in an online environment, trying to reach out and get to know the faculty is, is much more important. Mm -hmm. All right, so to the question about how many schools should we apply to and acceptance rates, things like that. So this is from uh, a survey last year, but it actually covers, I think, the last... Oh, it's actually two years. Yeah, so it's, uh, it covers the last two years. So what, what we see is basically, this is just on the, on the left here, the, um, the number who applied. Um, so number of students applying, we had, what, 37 in 2017 who applied to master's programs, 29 in 2018 applying to both master's and PhD programs. We had four and seven, so it, it here, you know, the vast majority of our students are looking at master's programs. Uh, and then actually only one each year applied to PhD programs only um, for the last couple of years. Um, and then here we have some uh, acceptance rates and this is where we get the numbers as far as how many schools people apply to. So for master's programs, people apply to uh, an, an average of two, those are averages, right? Yes, yeah. average of two. Um, they were accepted into an average of 1.37. Um, when it came to the PhD or PsyD programs, it was 3.75 was how many schools they applied to uh, with an acceptance rate of 0.5. What you can take from this is that graduate, uh, excuse me, PhD or PsyD programs are much harder to get into um, and therefore people apply to uh, quite a few, uh, or not quite a few, almost twice as many. I'll be honest, I feel like those numbers are a little low for they what are. I would recommend. Right. Yeah. Um, and so sure. my recommendation would be to uh, get closer to, I think, five to seven for master's programs. And, Agreed. Um, and then I think the PhD one is a question of, I, I typically don't recommend people apply only to PhD programs um, that they do. If they want a PhD, I want to look at that, that they consider something like this. And then I, I don't have as, I, I think, at that point, I'm not sure how many is sort of the, the best number. Um, I think it, because it depends how many of these you're applying to and that sort of thing. Do you have a number that you would throw? No, for masters, I would say the five to six range if you're only thinking masters. And then if you're thinking doctoral, definitely throw in a couple of masters programs and try to have a range, which I think we'll talk about later, about like your dream schools versus the ones that you're more confident or more confident that you'll be competitive for. So for doctoral, I would say like eight to 10 mm -hmm. as a general rule, knowing that the more schools that you apply to, the more expensive this process is, mm -hmm. right? And we haven't really talked about that, but every school requires an application fee. Every school that you wanna to go to requires the transcript, which is a 10 or $15 fee. You need the GRE, which is another fee per school. And then if any of the programs require you to come to the site or come to the school and, and interview, you might have some travel costs in there. I think um, this survey, um, we don't have the data to show you, but the average was anywhere between like $200 and $1,000 um, for, for this information. Um, and to be competitive, the more that you apply to, the more likely it is that you'll get in. Right. So it's kind of a balancing act for what you want to spend and what you want to put into it. Right. And that's why, that's why back at the beginning we were talking about, you know, thinking about how competitive the programs are because um, it, it is, if you, Obviously, people make their own choices about how they do this, but I would recommend against applying to a program that you just don't meet their requirements for because it's expensive. And this is a case where you're just truly so unlikely to, to get into a program if you don't meet whatever they consider the basics. It's, it's almost no chance at all. Right. Um, and so it's really just probably not worth it. Yeah. And so that's why, you know, be, as you're just, it's about maximizing your odds in a lot of ways. And, and you maximize your odds by applying to programs that you're a good fit for um, and by applying to enough. Right. And the other thing to just really think about too is um, trying to find out the information about how competitive their programs are. Mm -hmm. 
Most of them either have it online or you can call and ask, like, what is the average GPA of a student that you accept? What's the average GRE score of a student that you accept? Because if it's a 4.0 and you're at a 3.5, even though your 3.5 is really great, yeah. the average was a 4.0. So knowing that and then kind of betting your odds about where to apply is, is probably better. We have a question sort of related to that. It says, say you didn't get into the best, G the, you didn't get the best GPA to get into grad school, what options would you recommend to try to get it up there? To improve your GPA? Is that what the question was? I, yeah, yeah oh, okay. um, I read it verbatim, so oh, perhaps gotcha. raise it or. Okay. I, so one thing that I always tell people, if, especially if you're, you know, obviously do what you can to increase your GPA as much as possible. In your personal statement, knowing that you're applying that fall semester and that your spring GPA and your fall, your current fall semester GPA might not be included in your cumulative GPA yet, put that in your personal statement. Say, I had a horrible freshman year, or, you know, here's maybe why my GPA is lower, kind of explain some of that information. Um, the other thing that you could think about doing is taking some time off in between undergrad and graduate. Um, I know in school psych, you know, they love to see people that have actual experience in schools working with kids. So doing some substitute teaching, working in an after school program, you know, those kind of experiences and having a year or two of that on your resume with a lower GPA will, might help that GPA um, issue, not necessarily wipe it out altogether, but it would maybe help get you into the program more likely. Yeah, I think if you can explain it in the personal statement, that goes a long way. Um, you know, I think the other thing too is um, sometimes, again, this is a good conversation to have with an advisor, is if it's one or two classes that are really driving that GPA down and you think you can do better, if you retake those classes, there's a, that'll, that makes a big difference because it takes out that old class, that old version. And so you, you know, if you failed a class or got a D in a class and you retake it and get an A, that's a big, gonna be a big change to your GPA. But it, there are only some circumstances where it makes sense to do that. And part of it is what Janelle mentioned about when you're applying and whether or not that'll be factored in by that. Uh, some of it is also about whether or not you can actually realistically do better. Um, sometimes the reason you didn't do well in a class is because that, that material is really hard for you and I, I wouldn't want you to retake something and then not do better. Right. Um, so just some more data to show you. Um, so this is from 2017 and over here is the 2018 data. Um, and so it's just looking at, you know, of those students that applied, how many schools that did they actually get into? So the green bar on the very left is showing you the percent of students that weren't accepted. So they applied, and this is for master's programs only. So these are students that I'm applying to only master's programs, 14% in 2017 and 23% didn't get into any program. So almost one in four. So it's competitive, keep that in mind. Um, the far green, the other green bar I should say, is that they, these students were accepted into 75% or more of the places that they applied. So to put it in maybe a little bit more of an easier way to think about, let's say you applied to four schools, the green bar would say that you got into three or four of those schools, three at least, and that you could kind of pick and choose where you went. So really great numbers in terms of the students that are applying, um, you know, 51% and 63% in the last two years that kind of had their pick and choose of where they went. And then you can see the other bars that, you know, perhaps they got into one or two programs, perhaps they got into two or three. It's just kind of looking at if you applied to yeah. multiple programs, how many did you get into? So the point is it's competitive. Mm -hmm. You're probably not going to get into every single one. Um, it, I didn't. I sure didn't. I didn't. <laughs> I know you didn't. Um, <laughs> sorry. But it, it yeah. is going to be... Yeah. It is competitive. And and to Ryan's point before about um, living situations and, and mm -hmm. those, you know, um, really be mindful of that and thinking about, I, I always have students that say, oh, well, I want to go with um, my friend or I want to go with my boyfriend or my girlfriend. And, and I completely get that that might be really important and really um, a great relationship, but that is going to even limit it more. So mm -hmm. keeping that in mind is really important too. I, I think one thing I'd just say, Anecdotally, I, I know, and I'm not sure if this was revealed in the data, but that people who fall into these boxes are people who didn't apply to very many programs right. um, or apply to only PhD programs and things right. like that. But, yeah. um, and, and I think you know, my, my advice to this is obviously, again, people make their own decisions and have their own, but my, my bias here is that when we're thinking in the grand scheme of things, grad school is two to 
three to five years of your life. And being able to, being willing to move someplace really might open up some opportunities down the road um, that are worth it. Um, obviously people have different experiences, but in some ways this is the marshmallow test, but for adults, right? Because you can either, you know, you can live exactly where you want to live now, or you can have the career you want down the road. It's and a great map. It might be worth it. I can't remember what it is. <laughs> yeah. So. so to give you some more information about, you know, that those students that got accepted versus not accepted. So here's just, you know, I think this is our last piece of data just to show you. Um, so this is looking at GPA. So of the students that were accepted, the average GPA for the students that went to a master's program was a 3.57. And for a PhD, the average was a 3.8. For those that are not accepted, they're notably lower, right? But for the master's students, those that were in the not accepted category, their average was a 3.2, and for the PhD, a 3.4, right? Still a really great GPA, but not as competitive when you're thinking about doctoral programs. And then over here, we see um, students that participated in some independent learning experiences. Maybe they had better letters of recommendation. They also had a lot of things to possibly put on their resume um, or their curriculum vita. So here are the students that were accepted. And so you can see 30% of the accepted students did an honors project. 37% did it some kind of independent study. 70% did at least one internship and so on. And you can see that those numbers are lower in every case, except for the teaching assistantship for the not accepted group. Um, and so the teaching assistantship, and that's the second year in a row that that has been the case, it seems that that is less important in terms of applying for and getting into graduate school. Certainly a really awesome, cool experience. It definitely helps your resume. It's not gonna hurt you in any way. But if you think, oh, should I do a teaching assistantship or a research assistantship, do the research assistantship or do the internship as just the data is showing us that that seems to be more important to the schools. That's really interesting. I didn't know that about last year. Yeah, that was. Cool. Yeah. Okay, so a couple of final takeaways. I'm just going to do it. Go okay. for it. All right, so um, be strategic. It's expensive. Um, you also need to be realistic about you know, what your plans are and where you're going to go to. Um, keep your GPA as high as you possibly can, right? We're in that crunch time of the semester where, what, well, we have seven weeks left. Um, so stay strong. You can do it. Um, do your best on the GRE, do it right the first time. Do those independent learning experiences. There are some right now that are on the want ads, I wanna say, I know yeah, I have a couple. Right now, yeah. I have a couple that I'm still accepting applicants for, so go to the want ads, maybe we can put like a link or something you technological people can do um, to, to, to get those out there. Um, and then also, lastly, don't just watch this video, um, mm -hmm. but I thank you for staying to the end. Uh, definitely set up appointments with your faculty advisors. Come in and see us. We are here to help and we want to do as much as we can for you to get you into the school of your dreams. Mm -hmm. Some comments are, um, I think this is an alum said, there are so many wonderful real life opportunities available in the psych program at UWGB, so take advantage of everything you can. Not all universities have this. Oh, well, nice. thank you. Thanks, That's alum. so nice. And Amberly. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. how's it going, everybody? <laughs> um, and then someone, um, Sam Bart says there is a website called Niche that you can see the stats of different schools, acceptance rates, costs, and just a bunch of stuff that's really helpful. Cool. I'll find that and put it in the comments. Yeah. Can. And then Matthew Hersting says thank you for the information. So awesome. well, you You're are welcome. welcome. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for staying Very to the cool. end. Yes. Thanks. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.